pray with me. Lord God, I pray that my words would be your words, that your words alone may be spoken and your words alone may be heard. Through Jesus, amen. You may be seated. I don't know about you and your childhood, but I noticed a pattern in my own life when I was a child growing up, asking questions, challenging my parents. There was a common refrain, but it's just not fair. It seems that I had this well-balanced, well-defined balance or a set of scales in my mind about the rightness or the wrongness of an action. My fundamental worldview was simplistic, as a child's worldview might be. Life was supposed to be fair and just. The good was supposed to win. Evil was supposed to lose. Darkness hatefulness, bullies, and the like. They were never supposed to be winners. And if they won at all, it was short-lived. Evil schemes, evil people. Well, they lost, or so I thought, in my childlike fantasy world. But we grow up, don't we? We begin to have experiences where we see injustices and sometimes get away with their meanness. And when this happens, it's easy to become disillusioned and depressed. Now, I just finished an audio book of a popular 2010 pr publication of the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. The book is about Henrietta Lacks and the immortal cell line known as HeLa that came from Lacks cervical cancer cells in 1951. This book reminds us of other studies among the African-American population. It's the kind of thing where we are compelled to say it is not fair. One reference was to the 1932 to 1972 United Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis, this infamous, unethical, and racist clinical study conducted on African American men. We weep at these atrocities only to be reminded of Nazi medical abuses and experimentation, the details of which make our head and our heart hurt for a long time. The horror of human evil force us to recognize that these kinds of things are not fictitious horror stories, but they are real people in real time. We like to think the best of human nature with a happy ending waiting for everyone. We want to be like my younger self before I knew much about the real world. Reading and understanding the Bible can help us get out of a simplistic and unrealistic view of life. Our passage in Daniel starts with a dream at the beginning of chapter 7, which can be found on page 744 in your blue Bibles, and I do recommend you turn there. See, earlier Daniel had been interpreting the dreams of other people, and now he is having his own terrifying dreams of world systems represented as beasts. These beasts are hybrid mutant perversions of a lion, an eagle, a bear, and a leopard. When I think of the beasts portrayed in the book The Hunger Games, I think that the author of the book, Suzanne Collins, surely must have read the Bible for her inspiration of these scary animals with these mixing of weird traits. These beasts of prey are eager to devour flesh and they are used as symbols 
of forces that are ranged against God and God's good created order. The intended response to, for us is revulsion. Now, I need to take an aside. We have to remember that Daniel chapter 7 is rich in apocalyptic metaphorical language. See, Daniel is tr trying to convey truth by analogy, by relating something unknown to something we know from common experience. As such, images speak truth, but the images are not precise. The pictures being painted are trying to convey ideas that would otherwise be beyond our comprehension. These Mutant beasts are depicted in the first nine verses and the passage right here before our reading today. Now the scene shifts to a courtroom and Daniel gets a glimpse of the ancient of days with clothing and hair as white as white can be sitting on a throne. Now naturally I want to remind you again that we should not be thinking in literal terms but to catch the symbols here, that God the Father is pure, God is holy and righteous and wise. God the Father is the one on the throne and his holiness and justice is depicted as fire coming forth. This is the picture I needed to know as a child. Our God is a consuming fire. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This bears emphasizing because so many times people get it wrong. Now, people know that God is love. And when we emphasize that too much, we slide into thinking that God is permissive, like maybe as permissive as we would be as a parent. But God is also just. God is holy, and his presence burns up anything in its path which is not holy, anything that is unholy. Vengeance is his, and his alone, to set right. Now, as a child, it would have been good if I had known that it is true. Life is not fair. And God knows that. But one day the court will sit in judgment and the books will be opened, as it says in verse 10. God is holy. God is just. One day God will sit on his throne and set all things right. But the question is how? How does God do it? What other hints do we get from the Old Testament? So let's talk about the army of the Lord. And as we go back to this court image, we see in verse 10 that God is surrounded by a multitude of those who serve him, a thousand thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands. The idea is a lot. So many people, so many angels that they, we can't even count them. These are God's angels who have a special job. He, to be his army. That's right, the heavenly beings are mighty ones as a spiritual army who fought, fight on God's side. Verse 11 tells us that this boastful mutant beast was killed. So who killed the beast, you might wonder? The army of the Lord, of course. But what about these other beasts that still have power? Do they get defeated as well? We would do well to consider this if we are to make sense of verse 12. See, the speaking horn beast was destroyed. But as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So what's going on here? Does this explain why there is still injustice? Why we still cry out for evil to be stopped? 
the enemies of God, the demonic beings in rebellion to God have their dominion taken away from them, meaning they are no longer in charge, but they are left alive and still able to wreak havoc. We are still in a battle. And Paul understood this well when he reminds us in Ephesians 6 that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood type enemies, but the enemies of God who still operate on a spiritual plane. The rulers, the authorities, and the cosmic powers of this present darkness still wage war as spiritual forces of evil. That war affects not just the heavenly places, but our earthly place here as well. So what does the army of the Lord have to do with this cosmic battle between God and those in rebellion to God? So let's look at King David, who had newly become king, needing to get rid of his enemy, enemies, the Philistines, need, as he tried to protect his own army. David asked the Lord, what am I going to do about this in 2 Samuel 5? And God told him this. Don't attack them head on. Instead, circle around behind them and ambush them from the grove of sacred trees. When you hear the sound of shuffling in the trees, get ready to move out. It is a signal that God is going ahead of you to smash the Philistine camp. And David did exactly what God told him. See, the battle between the Israelites and the Philistines was more than just a physical battle. Marching in the tops of the trees were God's army, his legions of mighty ones fighting on God's behalf. This also suggests that evil spiritual warriors were fighting on the side of the Philistines. What occurs on earth has its corollary in the heavens. Maybe I'll say that again. What occurs on earth has its corollary in the heavens or heavenlies. We can think of this as a different dimension. In another Old Testament story, we know that Elisha, the prophet, needed to teach his own servant to recognize this spiritual battle. 2 Kings chapter 6 relays the story of how the king of, Assyri of Syria was annoyed at Elisha and had enough he was going to get rid of him. So when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? But Elisha told him, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is the reality that is going on all around us, even in the unseen world. This is the reason we can call out for justice and still have hope that of justice will eventually win. When God urged Gideon to reduce his troops, when Joshua walked around the perimeter of Jericho, even David's match against Goliath all point to this connection between cosmic and earthly battles. When we think of battles, battles that are unseen, it might be hard to grasp and really take it on. It is a challenge to our contemporary world view. But if we press in, accepting the view that the Bible tells us, we have reasons for hope. Even though we might be accused of being a Pollyanna type, we are actually not out of touch with reality. For the you younger folks, let me tell you about Pollyanna. <laughs> Although my literary folks might know her, I don't know. 
Pollyanna was this sunny, optimistic personality living in this perpetually positive world. She was a child, is what I have to say. <laughs> there were good things, but <laughs> we could be accused of being Pollyanna. And if we never cried out for the injustice or the unfairness of a situation, we would be unconnected to the reality of evil in the world, even evil that has been perpetuated since Jesus became king. But we understand from our scriptures today that the dominion of God's enemies was taken away, but their lives were spared for a time. That does not diminish the picture that Daniel wants us to see. Jesus is king. And Jesus stands before the ancient of days and is offered the dominion and the glory and the kingdom. And get this, we're included in this picture of triumph. Look at verse 14. That all peoples, nations, language, languages would serve the Lord. There is no room for bigotry or racism in God's kingdom. And for justice and righteousness loving people of God's kingdom, we stand on a promise filled with hope when just, injustice is made right. And although we originally started out with the kingdom of darkness, we can have confidence to approach the fire of God's glory because we have been sprinkled by Jesus' blood. Jesus the King, Christ the King. And we stand with confidence because his dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. God's kingdom is one that shall never be destroyed. And we will be invited to serve him along with the multitude of people from all nations. If I had known that as a child, I would have been satisfied, mm -hmm. deeply satisfied. <coughs> I'm at 